from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good afternoon, everybody, and thanks for joining us today at our Books and Beyond program. I'm Guy Molinar from the Center for the Book, and I'll just tell you a little bit about our organization if you don't know about it. Um, we're the section of the library, a very small section of the library that promotes books, reading, libraries, and literacy, and we do it not just in the Washington area, but we do it nationwide. And the reason we're able to do that is we have a state center for the book in every state. We have one in here in Washington, D.C., and we even have one in the U.S. Virgin Islands. And that's my boss there, John Cole, who is the head of our center for the book. <laughs> um, we also have a partnership program, and we have 80, 80 organizations in that program, and they are like-minded organizations that also spread the word of literacy throughout the nation. Another thing that the Center for the Book does is we play an important role in the National Book Festival, and this year it will be September 21st and 22nd, and if you've never been to it, I really urge you to come. It's a wonderful way to meet authors and to have their books signed by them and to hear them talk about their writing. And what the Center for the Book does in connection with the Book Festival is we invite the authors to come to the festival and we schedule them over the two-day period. And if you want to learn more about the Library of Congress Book Festival, just go to loc.gov slash bookfest. Before we get started, I just want to ask you to please turn off all your electronic devices. And I need to tell you that this is being recorded, so if you ask a question, you will likely become part of the webcast. Speaking of our webcast, we have more than 200 available on the Center for the Book site, and that's at read.gov. So anytime you see a Books and Beyond program that you're unable to attend, eventually you'll see it at read.gov, and you can attend it virtually there. Today's author's book is going to be for sale outside this room, and the author will also be here, and she'll be signing the book. And you can ask her questions there as well as after the end of this program. A lot of times we get asked how we determine who will be part of our Books and Beyond program, how we choose from the millions of books that are published every year, and the major criterion that we use is the author must have used the Library of Congress collections in his or her research. And since today's book is about the Civil War, obviously anybody doing a book about the Civil War would want to use the library's collection since we have the premier collection in the nation. And you should also know that we have an exhibition on the Civil War if you haven't had a chance to see it. And beginning March 22nd, there will be a special exhibition of the Gettysburg Address in Lincoln's hand. And the library has two of the five copies in existence. So if you've never seen the Gettysburg Address, this is your chance to see it. I also want to thank our co-sponsor today, which is the publishing office. And we're very fortunate today to have the director of the publishing office, Ralph Eubanks, and he's going to introduce our speaker today. Please welcome Ralph. It's my great pleasure today to introduce Margaret E. Peggy Wagner, whose job title officially is senior writer and editor in the publishing office. But if I were to give Peggy a more accurate job title, it would be Civil War and Military History Expert in the publishing office of the Library of Congress. Peggy is the co-editor of the Library of Congress Civil War Desk Reference and the Library of Congress World War II Companion. She's also the author of The American Civil War, 365 Days, and World War II, 365 days. In addition to her interest in military history and the Civil War, Peggy also has a great interest in American illustration. She's the author of Maxfield Parrish and the Illustrators of the Golden Age. So it's with great pleasure that I introduce my colleague and Civil War and military history expert, Peggy Wagner. <laughs> Thank you, Ralph. 
used the word expert twice, so um, that's a little bit frightening. <laughs> I don't know how expert I am, but um, thank you also to the Center for the Book and its entire small but mighty staff who puts on the books and beyond, and as you could tell from what Guy said, a host of amazing programs. I am in awe of them, as are we all in the publishing office. And thank you all for coming to what is going to be a whirlwind hop-skip tour of the Library of Congress illustrated timeline of the Civil War. Uh, being a presentation about the timeline, this will inevitably involve intermittent bursts of time travel in which we will be helped by um, some slides that I'll be showing as long as I'm coordinated enough to punch the button at the same time I'm talking about the topic. Um, a little caveat about those slides, most of the uh, illustrations you'll be seeing are in fact reproduced in the book, but um, there are about five of the illustrations that um, are not reproduced in the book and they're sort of to set the tone and to introduce you visually to people that um, are included in the text of the book. So having said that, let us take our first bout of time travel and go back with me now to the late spring of 1861. We haven't gone very far geographically. We are still in Washington, D.C. And some enterprising person has hauled a giant camera up to the top of the Capitol building. And here we see a view from the Capitol of the to looking to the southeast, where in about 150 years, the Madison building will be situated. Turning his camera around, which could not have been easy with the giant cameras they had at those days, there is a view of Northwest Washington. So it is a capital city, recognizable as such, but not quite our capital city. It's now, the war is about six weeks old. Military forces are still being organized. People on both sides still assume that the war will be short, possibly over by Christmas, and that their side will win. But in Washington, there's anxiety in part because of where it is situated. It is flanked on one side by the Confederate state of Virginia. It's embraced everywhere else by the state of Maryland, which is a Union state, but is filled with Confederate sympathizers, some of whom have already attacked troops heading for Washington. Uh, there was a stone throwing incident on April 18th, and then on April 19th, there was a major riot which resulted in 16 deaths. Nevertheless, today, June 1st, is very quiet, and the weather is much better. Please ignore the scene beyond the windows. It's a pleasant day. People have gathered on the lawn of what is then called the Executive Mansion, what we now know as the White House, to enjoy a concert by one of the bands that are um, coming to Washington. It's probably not this band that is giving the concert. It could be the U.S. Marine Band. But music will play a very important role in the Civil War. Today's program will probably not be the martial airs that we're familiar with from the war, that developed through the war. Probably it was a combination of classical airs and some of the sentimental tunes, such as Home Sweet Home, that are popular in both the North and the South. Suddenly, our concert is interrupted by rumbling which could not possibly on this pleasant day, again, don't look out the windows, um, could not possibly be thunder. So people, the concert ends prematurely, people dash to rooftops to see the battle that they assume is going on, only to discover that Union artillerymen just across the river at recently occupied Alexandria, Virginia, are just testing their guns. 
The operation to take Alexandria took place about seven or eight days before, and it resulted in the Union's first well-known casualty, the dashing young Colonel Elmer Ellsworth, who was shot by Alexandria innkeeper James Jackson after Ellsworth had the temerity to remove a Confederate flag from the top of his inn. Um, one of Ellsworth's men, Private Francis E. Brownell, immediately dispatched Jackson. A protege of President Lincoln, uh, for whom he had served briefly as a law clerk, Ellsworth had been celebrated for the military drill team that he had organized before the war. And he had more recently organized the regiment of volunteers that he was leading when he was killed in Alexandria. Even more than the deaths of the four soldiers killed in the April 19th riot in Baltimore, 12 of those killed were rioters, this single death shocked and was widely mourned by the North, with the possible exception of 75-year-old General-in-Chief Winfield Scott. No one at that time envisioned the long, rending lists of killed, wounded, and missing that would become the norm in this bitter war of Americans versus Americans. Ellsworth was killed on May 24, 1861. At about the same time, Abraham Lincoln is trying to understand what it will mean to be a commander-in-chief in a wartime environment. And he's also, of course, try still trying to set up his own administration and making political appointments. One of the most important appointments from our point of view here at the library is the appointment of a new librarian of Congress. This fifth librarian, James G. Stevenson, who lobbied um, actively for the role, was actually trained as a physician. He was from Indiana, and he's a fervent Republican. And apparently, he spent most of the time um, in his time in Washington serving in local hospitals as more and more sick and wounded came in. And he also served as an aide-de-camp with Union armies in Chancellorsville, at Gettysburg, and elsewhere. Fortunately, with a great deal of foresight, in September 1861, he hired as assistant librarian the now legendary in the library Ainsworth Rand Spofford who ran the day-to-day -day operations of the library and then in 1864 after Stevenson resigned. He became the sixth librarian of Congress. The 70,000 volume uh, library was at that time, of course, located in the Capitol building, which was undergoing renovation. Most particularly, uh, its dome, its old dome was being replaced by a new, stronger, larger uh, cast iron dome. So you can imagine that the banging and the shouting and the carrying on that was going on in the Capitol at that time that had absolutely nothing to do with politics. For a time also, the Capitol building served as a barracks for some of the troops that were coming in to garrison the city. Troops who, according to the architect in charge, Thomas U. Walter, were not overly respectful of the august surroundings in which they found themselves answering, for example, the call of nature, however circumstances seemed to dictate. The smell is awful, Walter growled to his wife in a letter of May 8, 1861. The building is like one grand water closet. Every hole and corner is defiled. There were also, of course, happier odors in the building. Um, for a little while, actually, there was a bakery set up in the lower floors of the building to bake bread for all the troops that came into town. From a librarian's point of view, this was a very bad thing since the ovens were directly under the Library of Congress. Fortunately, uh, congressmen started complaining when the bread uh, wagons were cluttering up the driveway, so that enterprise was moved out of the Capitol. 
So operating um, within, with these and other distractions, Stevenson and Spofford oversaw the beginnings of the Library of Congress's Civil War collections, which today, 152-ish years later, constitute one of the greatest collections, if not the greatest collection, of Civil War materials in existence. This amazing trove, which continues to grow, helps us to understand how the war unfolded, its amazing complexity, and how it was viewed by, how it affected and was affected by the people who lived through it. Drawing from this amazing resource, the Library of Congress illustrated timeline of the Civil War, like the library exhibition, The Civil War in America, for which it is a companion and a complement, commemorate, as the library is uniquely capable of doing, the greatest and most costly struggle in U.S. history, judging the cost by the number of American lives lost. The war is also, of course, a tremendously significant turning point in the development of the United States of America. A struggle at first to determine the fate of the young Democratic Republic, and eventually also a struggle to end the cancer of human slavery that had been festering in the body politic for more than 200 years. Like the exhibition, the timeline was a collaborative effort. It was a collaboration, first of all, between the publishing office and our private sector publisher, Little Brown. It's a collaboration within the publishing office and those who created the book between author, historian uh, Gary W. Gallagher, who wrote the introduction and who was kind enough to look at the text as it developed, and uh, with the amazing history detective and ace uh, picture editor Athena Angelos, with whom I've been lucky enough to work on several projects and who happens to be here today. <laughs> I also like to think of the book as a collaboration between the people today and the people of the Civil War era, who by their actions and the records they kept help inform us about how the United States came to be the country it is today. The book comprises four chapters and three sidebars, and the sidebars are on reporting the war, photographing the war and uncaring for its casualties. Using a very meaty timeline format, and I have never ever been accused of being terse, um, enhanced by excerpts from diaries and letters and more than 350 illustrations all drawn from the library's collections, this format allows the contemplation of a variety of simultaneous events which in turn helps demonstrate the massive impact that the Civil War had on so many aspects of the lives of Americans and aspiring Americans. Children as well as adults, civilians as well as soldiers and politicians, and civilians were affected in very many ways. Um, here we see evidence of civilian backup for uh, the military effort and their support for the, the soldiers. Here we see a scene that shows a more adverse effect of the war on civilians. The war also, of course, affected women as well as men. On February 10, 1863, Confederate nurse Kate Cumming departed from her detailed chronicle of hospital experiences to write in her excellent diary, which was published shortly after the war, of a wartime phenomenon experienced almost exclusively by the people of the South. It is remarked that there never were so many women and children traveling as there are now. 
numbers of ladies whose husbands are in the army have been compelled to give up their homes for economy and protection and seek others among their relatives. We have a large floating population, the people who have been driven from their homes by the invader. Just a few months later, in October 1863, Union poet and nurse Walt Whitman, who often wrote of the terrible damage the war wrought on the bodies and minds of Civil War soldiers, revealed in a letter to his mother that he and other hospital workers were far from immune from the suffering that surrounded them every day. It is curious, when I am present at the most appalling things, deaths, operations, sickening wounds, perhaps full of maggots, I do not fail, although my sympathies are very much excited, but keep singularly cool. But often, hours afterwards, perhaps when I am home or out walking alone, I feel sick and actually tremble when I recall the thing and have it in my mind again before me. A number of topical threads weave through the timeline. For example, a th one thread is the long, it follows the long and uncertain road to emancipation and the passage of the 13th Amendment and the parallel struggle of free African American men of the North and of the liberated slaves who were first known as contrabands and later after passage, after issuance of the Emancipation Proclamation as freedmen's, their struggle to be allowed to risk their lives as Union soldiers with the support of black women who like their white counterparts served as nurses, laundresses, teachers, and spies and who formed their own contraband and soldiers' aid societies. On January, in January 1862, eight months before issuance of the preliminary pro, um, uh, Emancipation Proclamation, activist John Rock, who in February 1865 would become the first African American admitted to practice before the US Supreme Court, condemned the continuing effort in the North to encourage free blacks to emigrate. And that um, program to encourage emigration had been ongoing since 1817 when the American Colonization Society was formed. Rock said, does anyone pretend to deny that this is our country or that much of the wealth and prosperity found here is the result of the labor of our hands or that our blood and bones have not crimsoned and whitened every battlefield from Maine to Louisiana? It is true, a great many simple-minded people have been induced to go to Liberia or Haiti, but be assured the more intelligent portion of the colored people will remain here, where we have withstood almost everything. In February 1865, about two weeks after Congress passed the 13th Amendment and sent it to the states for ratification, former slave Susie King Taylor, by then a nurse, laundress, teacher, and according to her memoir, an excellent terror downer and cleaner of uh, rifles and muskets, was then with Union forces um, that occupied Charleston, North Carolina. There were some black regiments that were included in this Union force. And the war, of course, had started in Charleston almost uh, four years before. In her post-war memoir, she reported on the black troops' reception by white Charlestonians, whose own troops had set fire to material they did not want to fall into Union hands as they retreated from the city, fires that promptly started burning out of control. When we landed, our regiment went to work assisting the citizens in subduing the flames. For three or four days, the men fought the fire, 
saving the property and effects of the people. Yet these white men and women could not tolerate our black Union soldiers, for many of them had formerly been their slaves. And although these brave men risked life and limb to assist them in their distress, men and even women would sneer and molest them wherever they met them. Another important thread, of course, follows the ever more terrible storm of military and naval engagements, as well as the Union and Confederate political struggles surrounding them. The book follows, for example, Lincoln's struggle to find an appropriately aggressive general-in-chief after Scott's resignation in November 1861. And my only editorial comment on the relative merits of his first choice, General McClellan, as opposed to his final choice, General Grant, will be seen in the relative size of the um, <laughs> photographs here. <laughs> the book also gave myself away. <laughs> the book also follows the, contra the sometimes controversial activities of the U.S. Congress Joint Committee on the Conduct of the War, and in the South, it notes Jefferson Davis's tendency to act as his own Secretary of War, something that uh, no doubt contributed to the fact that in four years there were five Secretaries of War in the Confederacy, six if you count one gentleman who served for four days as acting. <laughs> it also notes Davis's tendency to criticize almost all of his commanding generals with the exception of Robert E. Lee, who after serving as Davis's personal military advisor, assumed command of the Army of Northern Virginia in June of 1862 and proceeded to make that army the very heart of the Confederate military endeavor. Other political struggles dealt with conscription financing the war the suspension of habeas corpus, the feeding in the South, the feeding and supplying of troops that were increasingly pressed, troops as well as civilians, as well as matters less closely directly related to the war, including in the North passage of such hallmark U.S. legislation as the Homestead Act and the Land Grant College Act. As for combat itself, in many cases, we can see battle action through the eyes of the North's stellar special artists. And this is a scene by Alfred Wode um, that he made right after the Battle of Antietam, the single bloodiest one day battle of the war. The library's collections also allow us to experience combat via accounts from both sides of the battlefield. Plucking one example from many, and I may have plucked it because I'm very fond of both the participants I'll be quoting. The December 31st, 1862 through January 2nd, 1863, Battle of Murfreesboro or Stones River, Tennessee was a narrow Union victory welcomed by Lincoln after the traumatic loss at Fredericksburg, Virginia about two weeks before. It began in a very poignant Civil War fashion as the armies settled into position and they joined in singing Home Sweet Home. The battle itself was anything but sweet. The armies of each side suffered 30% more than 30% casualties, killed, wounded, and missing. An 18-year-old Confederate Lieutenant, James B. Mitchell, is in the thick of things with his Alabama regiment on one side of the battlefield, as he very shortly reports in a letter home. The balls flew around us like hailstones. Our company suffered very severely. Six men were killed outright and 14 wounded. Two men next to me were shot dead in their tracks, one receiving a ball in his breast and the other in his head and his brains came out. I saw it myself. At the same time, a ball passed through the coats I had on, my overcoat and blue frock coat. 
but thank God I was not hurt. As night falls on January 1st, there is a lull in the fighting. In the increasing cold and darkness, no warming fires are allowed. Mitchell and two comrades, and this is a quote, slept by turns, wrapped in a wet blanket and sitting up by the side of a tree, end quote. Meanwhile, across the battlefield, Union Brigadier General John Beatty pauses to write in his diary, which he published about 15 years after the war. Both armies want rest. Both have suffered terribly. Here and there, little parties are engaged burying the dead, which lie thick around us. A little before sundown, all hell seems to break loose again, and for about an hour, the thunder of the artillery and volleys of musketry are deafening. But it is simply the evening salutations of the combatants. The darkness deepens. The weather is raw and disagreeable. 50,000 hungry men are stretched beside their guns again on the field. Fortunately, I have a piece of raw pork and a few crackers in my pocket. No food ever tasted sweeter. Americans are not the only ones closely following the progress of the war. Governments and people around the world are extremely interested observers. And the timeline notes the diplomatic efforts made by both the Lincoln and Davis administrations to elicit or prevent various actions and reactions from the European powers, particularly Britain, which controls the world's largest navy, and France, which throughout the war had an army operating just across the U.S. border in Mexico, while back in France, its commander-in-chief, Napoleon III, who was no friend of democracy, looked hungrily at U.S. territory. <clears throat> Excuse me. The European powers were anti-slavery, and the Union's gradual move toward abolition had an appreciable effect on international relations. Still, most aristocrats in Britain and France hoped to see the great democratic experience, experiment, experiment pardon me, that was the United States permanently dismembered. Many non-aristocrats, even those whose livelihood was being affected by the war, hoped to see the experiment preserved, especially after abolition of slavery became a Union war aim. In January 1863, after Lincoln issued the final Emancipation Proclamation, the people of Manchester, England, a textile manufacturing center intermittently hit hard by the dearth of southern cotton, sent the president a letter, President Lincoln, of course, in stating in part, since we have discerned that the victory of the free north in the war which has so sorely distressed us as well as afflicted you, you will strike off the fetters of the slave. You have attracted our warm and earnest sympathies. In an address to the Sanitary Commission Fair in Baltimore in April 1864, as General Grant was preparing to launch what would be the epically bloody Overland Campaign the following month, Abraham Lincoln said, the world has never had a good definition of the word liberty, and the American people just now are much in want of one. And he continued, speaking of the warring peoples of the North and the South, we all declare for liberty, but in using the same word, we do not all mean the same thing. By December 1865, when the 13th Amendment had been ratified by the requisite number of states, the Union had been preserved but at a terrible cost. And historians reckon that cost to be somewhere between 600,000 and 750,000 people killed 
in the armed forces. But a new definition of liberty had emerged from the American Civil War, one that excluded the possibility that any American could ever again claim ownership of another human being. But liberty and democracy are not static concepts or permanently secure states of being. In a brief epilogue, the illustrated timeline notes the rise in the South of the lost cause mythology, which was promulgated by a lot of the Southern women, the very strong Southern women, as well as a lot of uh, former Southern officers, for instance, Jubal Early. And in these pages from his uh, scrapbook, his post-war scrapbook, on the left there's a list of people in one Virginia town who made contributions to, for a statue to be erected of Robert E. Lee. The timeline also points in the epilogue toward the troubled reconstruction era to come. So this concludes our short tour of the illustrated timeline of the Civil War, and I thank you for coming along on the tour with me. If, if there are any questions that I can or attempt to answer about the book or um, its contents or the war, um, please feel free, sir. Yes, um, the, the Civil War, history of the Civil War um, is very narrative in nature. And in many ways. <laughs> yes, but it's, either the, it's, it's very much a story. Mm -hmm. um, as you looked at it with, by slicing it just mm -hmm. across understandings and conclusions. In other words, what did the research in this, this methodology teach you that was unique? Well, it, every book I work on, every project I work on teaches me something, as do the um, people I work with, my colleagues in the publishing office, and I um, omitted, I think, thanking the um, many specialists and curators here at the library um, who uh, who take care of the Civil War collections. Instead of a straight narrative uh, history of the war, this timeline, as I indicated a bit in my talk, teaches me of the many different things that are happening at the same time and that have an effect one upon the other on the various streams here. We're used to thinking of the war, or any war, I think, um, in military terms, in terms of guns and drums, as some people refer to it. Um, and that has for a long time been the history of wars. We've gotten away from that in the past 10 to 20 years, perhaps longer than that, to, to think about people. But here I was able to follow um, the, each individual political effort, um, the efforts, the ongoing efforts that were still going on in 1865, for example, that uh, the Davis administration was making uh, to get recognition, formal recognition, from Great Britain, which was very important. And you would think that they would have given up by the end of 1864, but they did not. Um, and so I think it's mostly, I learn much more about how complex this was and what a deep effect, and I'm growing to appreciate that more and more, what a deep effect in so many areas of life the war had and still has, of course, on American life. Any other questions? Sir? Yes, I'm going to go see the exhibit in a few minutes. Excellent. Uh, I'm interested in uh, seeing the contents of um, what Lincoln was uh, carrying the night of his assassination. Yes. I was wondering uh, if you happen to know how the library acquired those contents, how they acquired those items. Well, Robert Lincoln did give that to the library, um, but we have with us <laughs> um, the Civil War curator who would be able to answer exactly how that came to us, uh, if you'd like to say a word. Sure. Michelle Kral. Um, well, actually, Rare Book and Special Collections has that. That's happened, true. So, um, but we're very fortunate, and this is how we build our collection, that the individuals involved recognize the importance of, of their materials, or their families did. So we owe most, uh, an, an enormous number of our Lincoln treasures and collections to 
Mr. Robert Todd Lincoln, who was Abraham Lincoln's only surviving son, who kept those materials. So they were rounded up, they were given to Robert on the night that he died, or uh, the night that Lincoln died, presumably, or for him later. And he kept them throughout the years and wrote a little note on the shoebox that these were the contents of his father's pockets. Um, and so his, his daughter, Mary, ultimately gave them to the library along with um, Mary Lincoln's seat pearl jewelry and some ink wells. Our Lincoln papers came directly from Robert Todd Lincoln as well. So that's how we build our collections are that the individuals keep those things and whether they're famous or whether they're ordinary soldiers, that that's more and more what we're collecting are the ordinary people whose own stories are, are so interesting as well. Yes, like, um, for example, my favorite person and who I quoted from today, um, Jim Mitchell, his family gave um, a small collection of his papers to the library and they do reside in the manuscript division and we're able to follow that young man from when he joined the Confederate Army at age 17 through his um, wounding and capturing his imprisonment and then um, we also, the papers include a certificate um, and a loyalty oath and a certificate that tells us that he was all of 20 years old at the end of the war. Um, and it also describes um, how tall he was and that he had dark hair. So we're able to get from these personal papers as well as the uh, official records we have and the published diaries and papers. Um, the general collections here contain a lot of material that was published either during or right after the war. And uh, those are, uh, along with the materials in the prints and photographs division, the geography and map division, the music division, host subdivisions, um, these things, they enhance our understanding of the war. So we get things in many ways. Anyone else? Yes. Well, oh, I beg your pardon. Um, why did Lincoln feel so strongly that the Union had to be preserved? As he was writing um, his first inaugural address, he said that the Union was a lasting and perpetual thing and that the Constitution of the United States allowed for no measure to dismember it. Therefore, this perpetual, it was his job as President of the United States to maintain the Union, and he felt that very, very strongly and maintained that. Well, it was his country. I don't know. I, um, I would assume that was his primary motive. And of course, he believed profoundly, being a self-taught person himself who had achieved being President of the United States, he felt very deeply that this great experiment in um, in democracy, in representative government, allowed people in ways that um, monarchies and aristocracies did not and never could to achieve their dreams, what we call now the American dream. And using as a witness his own life, I believe he felt that that was very important to preserve that kind of opportunity for ordinary folks. Yes. Many of them did. Um, there was, this was, well, I think, and I'm not an expert on power politics of the 19th century, but um, there was a great interest. For instance, Napoleon III really did want to take back, as he viewed it, some of American territory. Um, and there was a, a feeling that I think there was a knowledge that the United States was growing in power and influence and the potential was huge uh, and they would like to see that broken up. They were, of course, devoted not to representative government but to um, uh, aristocracy and um, this upstart nation, this, this experiment in democracy was something that they would prefer not to see succeed. Those are some, if I were to venture a guess, um, of the um, reasons. 
Although, you know, in some cases, again, it's European politics, for there was some trouble during the war over um, what is now Poland. The European powers looked like they might be going to fight over Poland. And so the Tsar of all the Russias, who was not all that much for democracy, but who had, in fact, freed the serfs in 1861, um, he sent his navy to visit um, ports in California and in New York City. Now this visit, and which were Union ports, now this visit was basically to position his navy to be in advantageous positions just in case war did break out among the European powers. But it also gave a huge burst, a boost to morale in the North. And as a matter of fact, they threw the greatest reception and party that they'd ever thrown in New York City just for these Russian sailors. So there was a mixture of reasonings um, through all of the international politics at that time. Yes? I don't, I don't, and did everyone hear that question? It's uh, the logistics of feeding the troops, which were difficult, more difficult in the South than in the North. I don't believe we can say it slowed down the war because the war just kept speeding up and getting more terrible. Of course, the people of the South had a unique problem. They were under um, a boycott, under siege. There was a naval blockade, and also Union troops were moving deeper and deeper into their territory. And as the war progressed, the Union start switched its tactics a little bit or switched its manner of making war from what you could call a soft war, taking great pains um, to protect the property of the Southerners, to the very hard war that evolved in 1863-1864. And in 1864, Ulysses Grant, of course, sent Phil Sheridan into the Shenandoah Valley, which was the breadbasket of the Confederacy, and said, take what you need and destroy everything else that could possibly be of use to the Confederate forces. Northerners were more fortunate. They had more people available to till the land. In the South, one of the reasons the South touted slavery as helping their war effort was because slaves tilling the land would allow more white men to go into the army. Nor there were more men served in the Northern Army, but the population was greater in the North, plus they had more technology to till the land with. And, I, as, and they evolved a better system of distribution. Uh, quartermasters are essential to any army, and, um, and the uh, U.S. had a great quartermaster in Montgomery Miggs. But it's also true that both armies foraged. Um, Grant, when he was on his second and successful foray to take Vicksburg, lived off the land for quite a while, as did General Grant um, when he was um, on his campaigns in the South, uh, General Sherman, when he was on his campaigns in the South. So there is a mixture of things. Also, railroads were important for transporting um, materials, including food. And the North had better railroads. Uh, the South tended to have different gauge railroads. Um, sometimes they would have to stop at a state border and offload things from one train and put them onto another. Um, all of these things sort of mitigated against um, the South feeding its troops all that well. Sir. <laughs> uh, I did not bring my crystal ball. <laughs> I think eventually, um, 
and this is just a personal opinion, I think that there, the situation had built up so gradually and every time there was an opportunity um, to defeat was at what was at the heart of the war, um, which is slavery, in my opinion. Um, it was put off and it was resisted by the South and then of course after Cotton became king, um, then slavery really became an economic, a huge economic factor. So the fact that many people in the North were coming away from slavery while the Southerners were tending to depend more and more on it, I think inevitably there would have been a clash. It would be nice to think that perhaps um, down the line a peaceful solution could have been reached, but I really don't think that was possible after the 1860s. Sir. <laughs> Never under, maybe you know the answer to this question. Probably not. By the time Sherman's <laughs> army entered South Carolina hmm. and marched the sea, why did the, the Union Army destroy Columbia, which I know is the capital, but did not destroy Charleston, which was really the hotbed of secession? And you go to Charleston today, it's such a beautiful city. It but is Columbia a beautiful city. It's not a beautiful city. Yeah. Hey. <laughs> My big brother lives right outside of Columbia, so, <laughs> and it's not beautiful, and Charleston is, because my big sister lives right outside of, Colum of Charleston. But it is a sort of um, mistake, what can be a sort of mistake, um, that the Union forces destroyed Columbia. They did set some fires, but so did um, uh, Confederate cavalrymen who were withdrawing from the city. And fires, when they are set like that, tend to get out of control as they did in Charleston and as they certainly did in Richmond. Uh, some Union soldiers apparently got drunk and disorderly and helped things along, but it was not a deliberate attempt, as far as I know, to, to level the city. That said, Union soldiers, when they went through South Carolina, because it was the state that led the secession movement, according to some accounts that I have read, including those of soldiers who were there, officers who were there, who said that their men got really um, more destructive in South Carolina. And then when they, one officer said, but then when they crossed the border into North Carolina, they took much more care. So part of that had to do with, with blame for South Carolina. And I think I had better sort of wrap this up, but <laughs> thank you very much thank once again. <laughs> this has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.